this whole journey of you being like, okay, I'm going to start my business and actually start it. Where do I need to concentrate my time now? All right. For, in order for me to concentrate my time on this, then I need to bring in somebody who's doing this. I want and expect out of life has always been changed by being a mother. And mothers have superpowers. Uh, we're able to do a lot of things that other people can't. And I didn't understand why people diminish these capabilities. I thought, I can negotiate with a two-year-old who can't finish a sentence. So, of course, being an American, I started in the garage, low cost, um, bootstrapped everything. Welcome to a new podcast from Becominator, the entrepreneurial hub made from entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs here in Barcelona, Spain. My name is Pedro Gil. I'm the investment manager here at Big Combinator. And today I'm with Stephanie Marco, founder of the Stickets Company and chief executive mom also at the company. So Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing today? Thank you for the invitation. I'm doing great. Okay, awesome. Stephanie, I need to start this podcast just asking the question that I've had since I know your profile and I know everyone is looking at me right now trying to ask this question. What does that mean? What is a chief executive mom? We're going to go through your whole history, but we're going to get, but we want to get there before. Chief executive mom. So um, there's a few different reasons behind that title, but it's thanks to a young man, a young entrepreneur, that it came to be my official title. Uh, a few years back, well, several years back, I gave a talk on thinking big at a conference and a young entrepreneur came up and asked me, uh, can I come visit you? I'd like to see thinking big in action. I was like, of course. So he came to the office and he was, I was giving him the tour of the office and then I was giving him a tour of the factory because the office and the factory are, co are combined. And about midway in the factory, he stopped. He looked around and he says, wait, I find it really, really hard to believe that before all of this, you were just a mom. <laughs> and I was in front of him and I stopped and I turned around. It was just a mom hit my brain like a slap in the face. And I, and I looked at him, but he had a big old grin And I thought, oh my gosh, his backwards insult, he meant as a compliment. And so I just smiled back and continued on the tour. But that just the mom stayed in my head because I thought, well, he finally said out loud what I suspected all along, right. that much of society thinks that once you have children, for some reason, your capabilities are diminished and you're only able to take care of children and maybe the home. Anyway, fast forward a few weeks, we were um, doing an exercise to unify our titles and our LinkedIn profiles and our Outlook signatures. And I looked at my title and it said founder, CEO. And I thought, you know, I really don't identify with that. But I couldn't think of something, you know, at the time people were putting Ninja and, and right. all these funky titles. And at the time I was like, well, and then just a mom popped back into my head. And I said, you know what? If people think that, I'm just going to lean into it. Absolutely. And I'm going to put chief executive mom down because that really is who I am. Absolutely. Awesome. That's that's such an inspiring story because I feel like those are the moments where we actually define ourselves. And I feel like from there, we can actually express to the world and do our jobs better. So how, how has this shift from being just a CEO <laughs> to being a chief executive mom has actually changed like your whole perspective of business? Um. Is, uh, when I started the company, I thought well, the whole process came about because I because I'm a mom and I'm a mompreneur, which is uh, an expression that was popular at the time. I don't know if it still exists. But the idea of what everything I was doing was because I was a mom. And then going into business for some reason or professional life, uh, people want you to forget that you're a mom or try to separate your personal right. life from your business life that for somehow you can like divide into two, two beings. And I thought, you know... Everything I do is at the point of view of a mother and everything that I want and expect out of life has always been changed by being a mother. And mothers have superpowers. Uh, we're able to do a lot of things that other people can't. And I didn't understand why people diminish these capabilities. I thought I can negotiate with a two year old who can't finish a sentence. Absolutely. So what does that mean to negotiate prices? Right. You know, that's easy. Right. You know, do it with a two-year-old. Right. Um, so yeah, everything that I do, everything I think, the way I manage the team, and it's a team, not a family, um, is based on much of my learnings from being a mom. Absolutely. I, I feel like most of these learnings and, and, and things that you're bringing into your company and both into your life and, and your life as an entrepreneur or a mompreneur are just realizations that you, that you have through life. So, so 
I would rather just move uh, backwards into your story <laughs> to see like how those realizations actually came to your life. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? We all know that you're American. You have been here. You just told me like 27 years in Catalonia. So how did that come to happen? I already know the answer, but 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 maybe for uh, for our audience, you can you, you can tell us a little bit of where you grew up, what were you doing there, how do you switch to come here to Barcelona, and and then we can go through your whole uh, mom journey. Okay, so how did I end up in Catalonia? In high school, uh, I went was my, my last year of high school. I was a senior in high school. I walked into my calculus class, which is advanced level math. Right. And there was a guy sitting there and I was like, oh, man, he's not from here. Yeah, Dark, yeah, right, attractive, right. much like you guys. Right, right, right. Like, you right. Know, he, was, he, was, he was hitting a <laughs> pan with tomato and you were like, hey, this is, this is not American at all. <laughs> anyway, um, he was really good at math, but he was not very good at English. And okay. our, our math teacher suggested I tutor him uh, so that he could get through the class and use the grades to finish high school as well. And so I started tutoring him and um, we got to know each other a little bit more. And then we fell in high school love. Of right? course. Yeah. But I had my plans. He had his plans. Um, so I continued on my plans. At that point in time, I was going to be a Wall Street okay. stock broker. Oh, look at that. I was going to go to New York and I was going to live in Manhattan and I was going to live the high life. Right. When was this? Like, uh, so I was 18. We're talking about 1988. Okay. 80s, 90s. Okay. All right. I'd seen too many movies. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we all have. That's <laughs> that's probably one of the reasons why, why I'm working here <laughs> at a venture capital firm. Yeah. I'd seen way too many movies. So anyway, so I continued on my, my college and um, finished college. We decided that, well, to do master's, maybe we would coincide in the same city. So we both ended up in DC uh, where I did a master's and he did his MBA and decided, well, we're going to get married. But at that point in time, he was heavily involved in his family's company and being married, getting married meant that I would have to move to Catalonia. Okay. You also have to know that in my childhood, I had this fascination for castles. I had a collection of castles. I drew castles. I love castles. And this man told me that his family had a castle. Right. I was like, oh, man. Right. And my mother had told me, if you wanted a castle, you got to go to Europe. So, you know, the whole idea of castles in Europe wasn't so far off in my brain. Right. So I was romantic. I came here in um, 1992, the Olympics in, in Barcelona, right. the Olympics in Barcelona, and the World Trade in Sevilla mm -hmm. was at the same time. Came here. He took me to see the castle. The castle turned out to be a pile of rocks. It was their pile of rocks. He was right. There was no misinformation, just right. a bait and switch, maybe. Um, and then went to Olympics and Sevilla. And I thought, you know, this is a great place. This is a great place. I could, I could live here. Being a little bit naive, what it means to move to another country and live in another country, which you have yeah, 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 experienced. I, yeah. Um, but I was all in. So if this is what it's going to be, this is going to be. So that was 27 years ago. I am in break even. And my journey <laughs> as an expat, wow. I moved here when I was 27. I've been here for 27 years. We live outside of Barcelona, which is why I speak Catalan. We talked about that. I speak Catalan. My mother-in-law informed me that first I had to learn Catalan. And then if I had time, I could learn Spanish. Which you never did. Which I never did because I told Tony that really the only Spanish I really like is Argentinian Spanish. Because that's right. just actually beautiful. I mean, I love the way they sing. Right. And I said, well, if you want me to learn Spanish, we have to go to Argentina. And we haven't gotten there yet. So. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so I feel like this this whole love story that brought you to Catalonia, it's also the beginning of your mom's story, right? So so why don't you take us uh, through that? Like, what were you working at the moment? And what was the... I feel like most moms, most of them, go through this phase of saying, okay, I'm ready to be a mom. So what, what does that actually entail to you, to your life? What changes did, did you have to make? Like, when did you turn from, you know, being, being a teenager that was in love, then to living in Catalonia, and then to, okay, I'm going to be a mom as a full-time job maybe for a while? So I'm um, focusing on my professional life, which is mm -hmm. uh, hard to separate. But before coming here to Catalonia, um, I had worked in marketing for an airline agency and I had worked in mortgage banking. So I had um, and I'd studied business, like I uh, said, that I wanted to be out in Wall Street. I decided I did not want to be in Wall Street when I realized that stockbrokers are just glorified car salesmen. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. I burst my bubble. Um, but at the time I thought, well, when I moved to Spain, I need to do something 
fast. I need a job fast and easy. And I was looking at a master's. I thought, well, I'll do linguistics uh, with a specialty in teaching English because that I know I could get a job right away doing right. that. So I came here, um, looked for a job teaching English because of my business background, ended up teaching English to business people in various companies and continued that career directory and was working on specializing in cross-cultural communication. You and I can talk the same language, but doesn't mean we're getting the same message. Right. And at the time I played football because okay. as a good American girl, that's what we do in the United States. So, we play soccer. So we're talking about American football or is soccer. It so okay, there you go. Soccer. So, you know, because it's a girl sport in the United States. Uh, right. Yes. Right. <laughs> Right. So I came here and I was playing on a soccer team. And right at 2000, I broke the ligaments in my knee. Okay. Like, like we all did. Like all, all of all, all of us teenagers, yeah. professional athletes, yes. we all broke something. <laughs> so um, it was funny because being a woman, they told me that I hadn't broken my ligaments. Had I been skiing, maybe, but just playing soccer, that wasn't possible. Oh, God. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But since it was possible, it changed my professional directory because I had uh, uh, several complications and I was unable to drive. And since I was unable to drive Barcelona, mm -hmm. I could no longer teach these business classes in English. And I had to find a job locally. And right. so I ended up teaching English to little kids, which was not my favorite. Oh, right, right. <laughs> and huge you, change here. It's huge. Huge. huge change. From business to kids, it's... Because of a sports injury. So um, I'm teaching English to kids, but teaching English to kids means working after school. Right. Right. So I did some business classes in the morning, not very many. And then I did classes in the, uh, at lunchtime to some people who didn't have jobs. And then I did type kids at the evening. So my, I was working all day, okay. not compact, but working all day. When we finally decided to have children, I sat down and thought, wow, if I have kids and I'm working after school, who's going to take care of my kids? Right. So I got, you know, my friend, the Excel out, did the spreadsheet. My salary is this much. It's going to cost this much for somebody to take care of my kids. My husband's never around because at that time he traveled. He was out of the country most of the time. And I looked at the bottom line and it was going to take more than my salary to pay for our child care. Okay. Then simple math, right? Simple math. Okay. Simple math says, you know what? On, on top of it, I'm going to have to hire somebody to take care of my kids. I'm not going to see them and I'm going to lose money doing it. This is a, not a win-win situation. Yeah, no. So I stopped working. Okay. When my first child was born and I had three children. And so I was a full-time mom for eight years of my life. Okay. So I'd gone from being a professional person to a teacher to a full-time mom. And, and, and how, how did you feel about your professional life at that moment? Like, was it like a sacrifice to you or were you like 100% in it? Where was your mind at when you started being a full-time mom? When my mind was being a full-time, and this was interesting because people would ask me, aren't you bored watching TV all day? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. And, and speaking to kids that cannot form full sentences and stuff like that, right? I was like, no, I'm not bored. In fact, when I looked around at the mothers who went to work in the morning when I dropped off the kids at school, the mothers who went to work in the morning and came back in the afternoon were far less stressed out than I was because okay. I had to drop off the kids in the morning, go back at lunchtime, pick up the kids, feed them lunch, get them to sleep, scream at them, clean up their mess, go back to school, leave them there for an hour and a half, and then come back and get them again. Right. So I couldn't do anything else. Mm. Didn't have time to watch TV. Um, and so I thought at one point, I thought this is exhausting, but fulfilling because I was able to see my kids walk. I was able to hear their first words. I was able to be there for them. It was very rewarding emotionally. But at some point, uh, part of my brain is like, this is not stimulating. Right. This is, you know, this is interesting. I, I challenged myself to do pretty much everything challenge I could. Mm. Um, so part of my brain started working on, well, what's the next, what's the next version of Stephanie? Right, right. What was, do you have like any specific moment that you remember, like this was maybe the turning point where, where you said, okay, maybe my full time job as a mom, it's coming to an end and I should start something else. Well, I knew that once Nora was in third or would be three, that she would be in school. Um, right during the whole day. So at that point, I would have some time to dedicate to something else. Uh, and I envisioned being a professional, but I couldn't at that time find a job that made sense here in Spain because the Spanish timetable at that particular time was basically you went to work at nine, you didn't come back till nine o'clock at night. Right. 
it's changed over the years and you guys and the young people have done a lot to to change that and yeah. i've also done my little little part to try and change that as well but it's just not family friendly hmm. um so professional jobs i knew that i wouldn't be working for somebody else and that on top of most bosses are idiots so <laughs> We might agree on that, <laughs> I must say. Um, I knew that I would end up doing something that was on my own. And okay, you knew for a fact that you wanted to do... I knew I was going to do something, okay. and I knew that I was going to have to be my own boss right? Um, in order to make the family thing work. Okay. Um, and at that particular time, I was really interested in making cakes. Okay. Pinterest wasn't a thing here in Spain, and American cakes with uh, the colors and the, the, the styles weren't a thing here in Spain yet okay. either. And I had made a few on occasion for my friends and people really liked them. And I thought, well, you know, I could make a business out of this. And then I got my spreadsheet out again, got my Excel and started okay. thinking, all right, so how long does it take me to make a cake? How much time do I put into it? How many ingredients do I need? Where can I take these cakes? Right. Wait, these cakes, I can't transport a wedding cake to Barcelona. This is a very local business. So if I do a local business, and then I want to expand, that means franchises. Mm -hmm. mm. Franchises, I don't like that concept. Mm -hmm. But so basically, we're talking about a one person show, what I'm capable of doing is not scalable. Yeah. This is a hobby. Yeah. This is not a business. It is a hobby. And especially in the hours that you were available. Usually, if you want to have like a gate business or whatever that you need to deliver yourself, you know, that usually the margins, which is what we talk about a lot here in finance, you know, they're not going to be able to do to support your business. So that business wasn't scalable. Okay. Teaching English, I already knew because it's at in the evenings. I knew that the future of teaching English was kids because eventually it'll get to the point that people here won't hire anybody who doesn't know English. Um, but that was in the evenings. That was not doable. So I went through various scenarios in my head, but it was always a thought process because really right. at that time I was dedicated to being a mom. And then the crisis of 2007 came. Hmm. United States, all hell broke loose. Right. The Lieberman brothers went under. Anything that you were in finances knew that the world was going to come to the end. Mm -hmm. Here in Spain, thought they were going to be exempt from, from the fallout. Everybody in business, I'm like, what are you doing to prepare? Nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and my husband's business was in construction. Okay. So, with, oh, yeah. Within the housing crisis. Okay. <laughs> well, it wasn't with the housing crisis, but he was in industrial construction, but construction in general, yeah. I knew was going to have a problem. Right. So nobody was thinking, nobody was listening. I was like, you know, this is going to be really bad. This is going to be really bad. This is going to be really bad. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I need to come up with a plan B for our family because the worst case scenario, all this comes to a halt. You know, in United, and Spain goes into a deep recession. Spain right. goes into a recession. There's no industrial buildings. We're going to have a problem. Right, because at the moment, you, you could actually see it coming from the States. 2007 and then 2008 and 9 and 10 came here. And so 11 is when it really hit hard. Right. 11 is when it really hit hard. Um, so I went through various scenarios in my head. What are plan Bs? What could that be? And at the same time, my kids were getting older and uh, moving on in school. And my son was in first grade. We okay. went to a meeting for the first grade parents. And they're sitting there and they're explaining the curriculum, the books, how this system works. And the teacher stops in the middle of the meeting. And he says, you know what? Um, before I forget, please, please, please mark their shoes. Their shoes. Their shoes. Okay. And I thought, oh, yeah, that is a problem. Because it was something I had been struggling with. Um, you have to think. This particular school, like many schools in Spain, they wear uniforms, so everybody has the same shoes. But even if they aren't wearing uniforms, all the mothers buy their tennis shoes at Decathlon. Right. Because they're constantly changing their sizes, and you always need new sh tennis shoes, so you go for the, the easy option for the Decathlon. So the kids all wear the same shoes. And my son particularly had problems. He was always losing stuff. And I had tried everything to label his shoes. I had tried writing inside, but when you write inside and then they sweat, mm -hmm. it goes away. And I thought, well, then I used some sports tape and wrote on that. And that didn't work. It balled up. And then finally one day, I just grabbed his shoe and I wrote on the outside of the shoe, on the top of it, Cal Rebus. Uh -huh. That's it. I solved my problem. A few weeks later, he comes back crying from school. And he's like, Mama, Mama, I can never win at hide and seek. 
but I always lose. And I said, well, what do you mean you always lose? Right. And he said, they always say, Paul Rebus, you're behind the tree. And I said, well, how do they know it's you? He says, because my name is on my shoe. Right. And here's the pain, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Here's the actual pain. So your kid was being found in hide and seek. That's it. Okay. My child was, I was ruining his life trying to solve my problem of labeling my shoes. And here the teacher is telling me that I have to, whatever we do, label his shoes. So then I was thinking, well, you know, I've seen some options. And at the time, um, the internet here in Spain wasn't a big thing. Mm. But you have to think, and now here's my age comes out. We were the first generation to use the internet before it was public in the United States. Right. Uh, so when I was in university, the, you know, uh, the, military had opened it up to the university system. So we had an internet within the universities. Tony and I used it to communicate. We had emails, chats, and things that, that people are, are, mm -hmm. are used to today. We were the first to users. And so when the internet became public two years after I graduated, um, I was obviously one of the first you know, to get on. And when Amazon came along, and then I was one of the first yeah. clients to buy from Amazon. So I was an early adapter and all these, these things. And so I went to the internet and looked for shoes for labels. And the internet said, no search available. No. Right, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this does not exist. Doesn't exist. Right. I remember seeing something in a magazine, a parenting magazine, uh, some sticker somewhere. And I was like, some Australians or something were doing stickers for shoes. And I thought, well, I could maybe make a sticker for a shoe. And I said, I said, my husband, what about stickers put in a shoe? And he said, well, yeah, go for it. And I thought, but if I make stickers for my sh kids' shoes, I know my neighbor's going to want them because she's trying to do the same. And then everybody in the class is going to want them. And then I'm going to be making stickers for all my moms. You know, really, the only way you can do this is with an internet business. Absolutely. So the question then, and that was 2008, the question then was not what or how, but if I wanted to do it. So it took me about two years to decide that, yeah, I'm going to do this. And how did I come to that decision was one night, um, Nora was sick, my, was my youngest, two o'clock in the morning. She was laying in bed and I was holding her hand. And I thought, you know, it's been eight years since I've slept a whole night between the kids, the dogs and the husband. Somebody was always up in the middle of the night. And I remember reading a blog from a mom, Panur who said that the only time she was available to do any of the work was at night. And I thought, you know, if I want to do a business and be a mom, the only possible way I can do that is working from 12 o'clock at night till four o'clock in the morning. Right. And since I hadn't slept for eight years, what's a few years more? Right, right. You were already <laughs> used to the time schedule, so you could do that, okay. So at that point it's like, okay, Stephanie, go for it. I mean, it's not going to change your lifestyle that much. You're going to not be able to sleep for the next few years. You might be a zombie. Um, and this might be a plan B uh, for what's coming in the economic crisis. So that was 2010. And as okay. I said, the economic crisis hit full force here, 2011. Mm. People are like, you're crazy. You want to start a business. All hell's breaking loose. I'm like, why not? This is... This is <laughs> Probably Perfect the best time. moment to start a business, right? <laughs> Perfect time to start when a business. everybody's bleeding, you just go out there, you know. All right. So, of course, being an American, I started in the garage, low cost, um, bootstrapped everything, wanted to provide a quality product for moms at an affordable price, given the economic crisis. I didn't want them to have to break the bank, and just assumed my husband just hoped, but I knew that the word of mouth of mothers would make this spread. Okay. Because at that point, Google ads existed and marketing, Virginia over there, was a thing, but not quite yet, especially here in Spain. Right. So yeah, we opened up uh, at the October, 2010. And as soon as the web went live, I had my first order. I was like, oh my gosh, this is wow. for real. Now I have to produce this order. Uh-oh. Right. <laughs> So yeah, um, from there, we continued to grow every two years, ended up losing, moving to bigger and bigger office spaces. When I started, I knew that since the product I was dealing with was just an envelope, I could ship that all over the world. So automatically from the day one, we were international. Well, internet is international. Um, so we focused on a global market. 
of mothers. Mothers are mothers, most places. Mm. Uh, we have the same problems, the same needs. And as a client that I completely understood because I was the first client. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the stories of entrepreneurs that actually um, see the problem within their lives and, 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 and they actually tend to go and solve it. Uh, we here at Become Air, we see so many entrepreneurs that they see a problem that they don't actually have and then they try to solve it. They don't have the proper solution because they're not the owners of that problem. But then entrepreneurs as yourself, you know, you, you actually have the problem and you actually gave yourself two years to think through the problem, try to solve it and then actually make a solution for it. So quick question, during those two years, 2008 to 2010, how do you label your, your kids stuff? So um, I did find some companies in Australia uh, that were doing some labels and <laughs> I remember when I, I, I was literally like looking at them like, how do they do that? Right. It was like, right, right, right. how do you make a sticker? This is <laughs> this is what I wanted to get to. Like, like how do you decide, hey, I can actually do this by my own and, and build it as a, as a business and then sell it. Like when that moment came to you? Um, I was always a very curious person and my father wanted me to be an engineer. Oh. So, Fixing things, exp trying to figure out how things work. You know, I had my toolbox and my father made sure I knew how to start a car with the pliers. Um, so I was never intimidated by machines or processes or, you know, how to. And at the same time, my mother taught me how to cook cakes and pies. <laughs> so I had this combination of, of, you know, making recipes, trying to figure things out, messing with things. And my husband is also an engineer. I thought, well, you know, there's got to be a way. You've got to be able to cut this this way and then do that. And then I see that they put a barcode and just sort of reverse engineering and then talking to people in the industry. So mm -hmm. then I started talking to a lot of people, um, asking a lot of questions, a lot of questions. I remember once uh, I had left my, some of my information at, a, at a, a Congress here, a printing Congress, and a guy from, from a printing company calls me. He says, you know, I'm at this address, but it looks like a house and not a company. <laughs> Um, I'm here to see a Stephanie Marco yep. and for a company, a name that I had just totally made up because I didn't have a company yet, but right. I put some fictional name down. And I was, and he called me at the time I was at the school picking up the kids right. and I'm like, oh yeah, this is Stephanie. Um, I'm in a meeting right now. And if, you know, if you just give me your phone number, I'll call you back and we can set up a, a arrange for a meeting. The offices are under construction. And our conference room isn't available. So we're going to have to meet in right. like uh, local bar. Is that okay? <laughs> right. Fake it until you make it. Yes. And you actually did it. I did. That's great. That's great. I feel like uh, we've been through this uh, this whole journey of you being like an, uh, a working woman, then being, uh, well, in love, a married woman, <laughs> and then also being a full-time mom, uh, mom and having this moment where you say, okay, I'm going to start my business and actually start it. But I feel like in most uh, actually successful companies, just as a stick, it's, there also comes a moment within the journey of the company when you say, okay, this is actually bigger than I thought. Mm. What was that moment for you? Because you started probably just uh, selling to one, then to 20 people, then to 100. When was that moment when you said, okay, I'm actually building not a little side job, but this is a whole business? Well, I never had that thought. Okay. <laughs> um, it just happened naturally. No. Uh, this is how I, I went. At the beginning, in order to start a company here in Spain, it's a lot of bureaucracy, a oh, lot yeah. of paperwork. Oh, yeah. And you can't do that by yourself. So you need, you need somebody. It's getting better now. It's getting better now. But um, you need somebody who can navigate those waters for you. Mm. A gestural company. I don't even know how to say that in English. Um, so I was shopping around. And I had to take my husband with me, as in when you go to meet banks and you go to meet these professionals, you have to take a man with you because, you know, right. a foreigner, middle-aged mom. Right. What does she know? Yeah. So I'm in a meeting with this guy and my husband and they're talking about football and Barca and blah, 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 blah. And finally we get on to the nuts and bolts. All right. So what do you want to do? And I say, you know, I'm going to start an internet company. He had no idea what an internet company was, right? And he looks at me and says, well, you know what? As long as you have fun and get a little pocket change, go for it. Right. <laughs> and then I was like. That's what, that's what working moms <laughs> can aim to, right? 40-year-old working, you know, 40-year-old moms who are looking for a hobby to start. Um, I bit my tongue so hard that it bled. Left the meeting and turned to my husband and said, if I want to have fun, I'll go to the gym or write a book. I am not starting a business unless it's going to be successful and it's going to be big. Right. So from day one, I knew that everything I would have to do and all the work, if I was going to stay up all night and if I was going to have to um, 
basically forget any part of Stephanie that existed, that this was going to be a big thing. And as I said, we're talking about envelopes. Envelopes can go around the world. There were no barriers to growth. Right. I had no barriers. So there was nothing to overcome in terms of how big I wanted to be. It was just how big I could imagine it to be. So is the inverse. Yeah. Not that I imagined that it would be big. That is like, all right, we're still not there yet. It's And we're still not there yet. Oh, it's <laughs> And we're still not there yet. You're still not there yet. <laughs> I, I feel like this whole mentality is probably what you also transmitted to your to your team within Stickets. Like, we are we are basically a, a mom funded company. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying before, you said something really really interesting that if we can deal with kids that are two years old and cannot even form full sentences, and we can convince them as human beings to go to sleep and to have full meals, we can run a company, right? I feel like this 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 sort of energy and mentality it's, it's something that you have bring into your company as well into Stickets. so tell me a little bit let's let's go into Stickets, which is probably one of the main reasons why you're here as, as a part of from your amazing mom story uh let's talk about Stickets, this the story of his uh Stickets. who was your first first hiree for example like apart from your husband uh who also came to you and said like okay this could be someone that that's gonna go with me through the journey and how, and how do you guys expand your team? How do you expand operations? Let's, let's walk through that journey. Well, you make a lot of mistakes. Absolutely. As a we all do. A lot of mistakes. You make a lot of mistakes at the beginning. Um, what you think you need and what you really need are two different things. You fumble along. Uh, you have some ideas, you have lots of arguments. And then at one point, you was, okay, I've got so many hats, you know, I'm doing production, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Where do I need to concentrate my time now? All right, for, in order for me to concentrate my time on this, then I need to bring in somebody who's doing this. Absolutely. So one of the first things we brought in was somebody to take over parts of the production. Okay. Um, and at the same time, Tony was, was um, experimenting with Google AdWords because it was a new and exciting thing. It was interesting. Put a little money in, money came out. Right. <laughs> um, And it got to the point where he needed help doing that as well. So it was basically, you know, at what point are we uh, at a breaking point of what we're able to do? Who can take over this work for us so that we can then concentrate on what we think need in order to grow the company? And at the same time, we also knew that we couldn't figure all this out on our own. So we started knocking doors looking for mentors. Okay. Um, so it was about three years in. We were adamant. We needed to get some mentors. We needed to get some mentors. We fell into a, a program, um, Startup Catalonia. It was the first pilot program of, of Axio. Mm -hmm. And we were part of 12 companies in Girona that were able to partake in their first system. And we had the luck of having Paul Baldez from Inbound Cycle right, be our right. first mentor. Oh, yeah. So Paul was our first mentor. And with his help and guidance, We learn to how to reach out to other companies, other entrepreneurs, start asking questions. What do you do? How did you do this? You know, should I go there? Should I get this? And it was really uh, an effort of what do we know? What do they know? What shouldn't we do? What can we do? What mistakes we make? There's no, it's like parenting. There's no guide. Right. You know, and everybody has their own ways of looking at things, their own values that they have to live mm. by, their own expectations. Um, so a lot of it is on intuition. Right. On, on gut feeling. Right? On gut feeling. I feel like most entrepreneurs that, actually, that are actually successful, they go through a lot of decisions that they need to make and they ask mentors, they ask everybody, they go through their books, through analytics, through internet. And at the end of the day, it's just a, it's, it's your gut feeling, you know, because it is your project at the end of the day. So um, what would you say within the, within the company, within Stickets, What do you say are the main initiatives or protocols or values that the, that you uh, got your got your team with? So we have um, four specific values that we have that are like our guiding light, our our northern star. The first one is solve problems, because the company came about from not an idea but a problem that I needed to solve. Plus. If you're solving problems and you're not complaining, you're not looking for people to blame, you're not mm, mm, giving excuses, you're solving problems. Okay. Right. So problem number one, work hard is number two. Uh, it comes from my Midwestern background, work ethic. If you want to get something done, you got to put some work into it. Right. And work hard doesn't translate into Spanish or Catalan very well. So when we translate, we say work with passion. 
Um, if you've got passion, then you want the best for something and you want to see it through. Our third one is be generous. Um, without generosity, if you're not generous with people, people are not generous with you. Okay. Uh, generosity at the end of the day means time. And time is your most valuable thing that you have. Does, so, does generosity within uh, Stick It, does it mean like giving more time to things that, that value the most? That it is? gives giving time to your coworkers, okay. giving time to the clients, giving time to the suppliers, giving time to everybody who's an ecosystem, including the, your own family. Right. So be generous with each other. Be generous with the system. Yeah, maybe within the ecosystem, we tend to try to go really fast through stuff and say like, hey, we have this 30-minute meeting and then we have a 15-minute meeting and then we have a five-minute meeting and then I'm going to have 35 minutes for lunch. And I feel like this might be one of the values that, that, that actually drives the most people or the best people to work with us. Actually, be generous with your time, with, with, with how, how you're spending your most valuable asset, which is your time. Exactly. And um, so and our fourth, our fourth uh, value is think big, dream bigger which is why the vision right. of we're not there yet. Right. We still got to go. And how our values work. Um, everybody has values. All the companies have values. Whether people have them identified uh, is another story. And we have identified these values and we work with them. Why? Because the moment that you detect a person, a system, a company is going against your values, then this relationship has to end. Okay. So if you have your, identi your values identified, and like you said, be generous. So if I'm generous with my time, but then I come up with somebody and they say, you know what, you, you, you were five minutes late. I don't care that you were in traffic for an hour and a half. You know, it took me two hours to get here. Uh, I don't care if you're in traffic for an hour and a half. You were five minutes late. I got to go. All right. right. Well, if you're not going to be generous with your time, then I'm not going to be generous with my time. You know what? This relationship is not going to work. So right. thank you for telling me that right away. This is the end of the relationship. And the same time. So, so if you meet somebody who has those values that are aligned, they don't have to be exactly the same, but they're aligned with yours, then that relationship can work. And that can be on the level of team members, that can be on the level of suppliers, that can be on the level of partners, that can be along the level of, of clients. Right. right. So values are really important to understand and understand where you're not aligned because that makes life so much easier. At the end of the day, business is just relationships. Absolutely, absolutely. Talking about your, your, your business uh, values, I feel like one of the questions that I actually wanted to get to is like, from what, from what we have read, uh, within Sticket, you have a very female dominated wor uh, uh, work, um, workforce, right? So how do you think this has, was it like a conscious decision and how do you think this has affected production and, and well-being within the company? Balance. I hate the word balance. I really hate the word balance. But okay. <laughs> when when you have anything that's lopsided, it doesn't work. Right. right? So if you have anything that's male heavy or female heavy, uh, it's not going to work. What works? It works when you have a blend of talents, a blend of concepts, a blend of ideas, a blend of people. What happens so often in in especially startups, uh, it becomes male dominated. Um, The, what then happens is alternative opinions are not heard. Alternative ideas are not necessarily heard. Men are great. I love them. <laughs> well, you have a husband and, yes. and, and two kids, I, I believe. I have a husband and one, one son. I have three brothers. Um, but what can happen is uh, women tend to be more, more collaborative. We tend to listen more. We're able to run meetings just a little bit better because we're able to pull out people who aren't talking mm. or get the ideas that aren't being expressed. Um, so there is a yin and yang in how we're able to do things. Uh, and if you're missing part of that equation, it's hard to create a high functioning team. Okay. And my objective in Stick It above anything else is to have a high functioning team. Okay. Do you feel like this is uh, more, more related to female workers or to mom workers? Do you feel like there's a, there's a, because I feel like we also saw in one of your interviews that, that uh, you kind of move towards uh, moms because they tend to be like more efficient and better at the workplace. Is this true? And, and, why, true. and why have you seen it? This is true. Um, 
Mo mothers, you have to think, a mom has a million things in her head at a time because I know the shoe size of all my children, what their schedules are, when they have appointments. On top of it, I know if my husband needs deodorant or toothpaste, right. on top of everything, all the K KPIs of my business, right? So if I'm able to keep track of all that information, I'm going to have to be an efficient person with my time. Mothers don't have time to waste. Right. I don't know how many business meetings I've been in with all men and it's like five o'clock and they're sitting around just talking about whatever, Barca or, or, yeah, or whatever. whatever. And I'm like, all right, we got to get going because I need to leave. I've got a thousand places to be. Right. You know, time, I'm generous with my time, but I don't waste my time. I'm efficient with my time. Do you think it is a matter of, of, of course, efficiency, but also would it be a, a matter of drive well, between parents also? The other part of, you have to understand, Stickets um, is a product of four mothers. So in our team, if you don't understand our product, if you don't understand our clients, going right. back to what you said, if an entrepreneur or the team doesn't understand their clients, how can you possibly sell to them? Right. So there's the part of, understanding the needs, understanding the mindset of your clients that is really important for us, which is another reason why I tend to like mothers. Um, and mothers are very focused. They're, they've got their limited time and attention. They know where they need to put it. They know their abilities. They're often shortchanged in society. Right. Um, moment you're, like I said, the moment that you're a mother, then your capabilities are somehow diminished, which is not true. So given an environment where they're allowed to thrive, I'm, I'm talking like they're animals in cages, but, 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 but <laughs> given the proper environment where they're right. allowed to thrive, right, right. <laughs> the professional monster in them comes out and lives and which works. Is, which is probably <laughs> what you're looking for in an employee or in a partner, right? Some, exactly. Someone that's, that's going to go out there and make everything that they can do for your business. I feel like mm -hmm. actually one of the questions that we ask entrepreneurs all the time is like, what would you say your superpower or your partner's superpower is? And I feel like your superpower is just being a mom. Exactly. You know? um, I actually uh, years ago wrote an article. I used to write for V and Preza quite a bit about the superpowers of moms. We have so many capabilities that people think or don't understand. I mean, one of the things that happens when your brain is literally changed when you become a mother. Right. So what your brain does is it gets rid of the stuff that it doesn't need in order to make space for all that information that you have to maintain. So there's a physical change in your brain and you're able to maintain and coordinate far more information after motherhood than you were before. You also create a sixth sense so that you wake up in the middle of the night two seconds before your baby starts crying. Wow. And so this sixth sense is then, then up, can be applied or used in different situations. There's a whole series of physical things and, and physiological things that happen to mothers. And then there's a whole process of being part of the motherhood. You've got a different point of view, a different aspect. Right. You bond with other mothers, even though they're on the other side of the world. When you see a mother crying because their child is born, lost in war, you cry because you can imagine what that means to be. So there's a whole link into a system of motherhood that it's hard to explain. And people who, who haven't gone through women who haven't been mothers or haven't been mothers yet think they understand it until they are. It's like fathers, the same thing happens with fathers. Until yeah. they have a child, until you have a child in your arms, you don't understand what that means and how it changes your life. Absolutely. So instead of, of saying, you know, mothers are uncapable, then I like to tap into those, those capabilities and show them that, you know what, You're, you are capable if they are ever doubting. And what, the majority of people who work, they don't ever doubt. No, no, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they, are, they are more than capable. So kudos to, to, to all the moms, especially my mommy, if you're seeing this. To, to, to my sister, she's going to be a mom again in no time. And, and actually share, sharing this experience with her, I think, with my sisters uh, so much through their motherhood. And, and I can see these changes, like physical, physical, uh, mental changes that she's able and all the moms that, that I see, they're able to support and manage so much information, so much going on that for me, it's, it's impressive. I have five minutes in a day and, I, and I'm exhausted. You guys go through 4 a.m. Well, as we were saying, working through the whole night and then actually being being a full time mom. So so, yeah, thank you so much uh, for sharing this. Unfortunately, I think that, that, that we should be uh, getting to the end of the podcast, but I didn't want to end this podcast without asking you for the fun stories. What would you say are the top two or top three fun stories that, that you have had? through your company creation? Because there's, I know there are so many, but what would you say are the top one or two? Well, I laugh at all the stories because I believe laughing is better than crying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
So I find everything funny. Right. <laughs> like, we oh, must. they we printed must. on transparent material instead of what it was. And we lost all the orders. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, let's take it as a joke. Yes. Right. Um, so I laugh at everything. Um, there is one story that, that I think is funny uh, and related to much of what we've talked about today. Once I was at a board meeting and as usual, not usual, but typical, I was the only woman at the table. I think there was about eight or nine entrepreneurs there. It was a lunch meeting. Lunch was winding up and we were waiting for our coffee and it was getting late. I needed to go pick up the kids. Mm. You know, they were sitting around, they were talking. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll make I'll make the kids uh, and thinking of all the things I have to do in the evening uh, before going back to work. And somebody started, one of the guys started talking about all the sacrifices and problems that one encounters being an entrepreneur. And he was giving all the sad stories. Oh, I gave up this and I couldn't go on vacation. And, oh, and then another one starts on, yeah, you know, and then uh, this really sucks and that's really bad. And then one guy, this is, you know, I was like, this is getting really dark, but I usually keep my mouth pretty quiet. And then I, and one of the guys says, well, you know, it's not all bad. I mean, we're here, right? We've had some level of success. Right. Our companies are still going. And he said, and we have to be grateful. He says, we really need to be grateful to our families and to our, and he looks at me. And I thought, finish the sentence. <laughs> Do finish it. the sentence. Do it. <laughs> and he said, our families. Right. <laughs> for right. all their right. love and support that they've given us. Right. And at that moment, I thought, oh my gosh. Shit. I want a wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wish I had a wife, right? <laughs> right, right, right. I thought, I'm looking around the room and I think they're all calm and relaxed. They don't have to because their wives or their partners or somebody else is going to go pick up the kids after school right now and take care of all their other problems. They only have to concentrate on the business. I was like, crap. And if I was only you could concentrate was, only on your business, right? I was driving I was driving to the school and I was thinking, I want a wife. I want a wife. I want a wife. I really need a wife. And then I started thinking, I know women who have businesses. I was like, well, how do they do it? And I was like, oh shit. They all have nannies. Oh my gosh. Why did I not wait? Then it was like, okay, now I understand a little bit difference about what it means to be an entrepreneur and all these men and all these books. And I started thinking, all oh, those books, there's always a dedication in the beginning of the book to right. my wife. Right. <laughs> right. Like, Where do I get one? I want one of those. <laughs> you needed one of those. You needed someone to, to actually help you <laughs> to all of those stuff so you could uh, focus on one thing. So at that point, I was like, you know, I can't possibly be a wife and a, and a, and a, a good wife, a good mom, a good entrepreneur. Right. So instead of trying to separate all and have a wife out there, uh, I just combined into one. And I ran the company as, as I did um, uh, be a mom and my family as a business. So we all combined totally it together that. into one being. And that was how I solved my wife problem. Look at that. <laughs> I feel like that could be like one of the best solutions. So, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing. I really hate to close this. Uh, I think that, that we're probably going to have a coffee later so we can tell way more stories. So, but at the moment, thank you so much for coming here. We appreciate you being here. To all that listen here today, thank you so much. And don't forget to watch the next episode. Thanks. Thank you.